tying compensation to stock performance. But the reform has led to a new controversy. CEOs like AT&T's Allen now benefit directly when the bottom line is improved by letting employees go. And at the annual meeting, Allen's compensation, some five to 16 million or more dollars, depending on how you value his stock options, was the hot topic. Yes, uh, my name is Ed Fegan. I'm representing the Teamster Pension Fund. And Mr. Chairman, I arrive to object to the election of each of these board members. Simply put, each of these board members has failed in their basic task of deciding your pay. I'm wondering about your confiscation of $20 million a year in salary and stuff. Are you timing about the bonus from you? How come it came right on top of the fact when 40,000 people were <clears throat> laid off? Why didn't they wait till things were cooled down, at least? <laughs> CEO Allen responded by defending himself, his board, and their restructuring of AT&T. If you as shareholders don't benefit, I don't benefit. And when you get to the other issue that's had a good deal of misreporting, and I'd like to clarify it, it goes to the options that were awarded to me and other senior officers uh, by the board uh, late last fall. They were options that today have no value, absolutely none. They are not worth the paper that they're written on. But they do have an incentive for all of us at the senior level to be sure that this restructuring, this transition, is successful on behalf of AT&T's share owners and its employees. And the way they do this, if the stock price goes up, you benefit. If the stock price goes up, I benefit. To understand what led to all this, you have to go back a few months to the much publicized downsizing and the trivestiture that occasioned it. The trivestiture was a radical move. AT&T would split itself into three separate companies. The new AT&T, which will supply phone and other communication services, Lucent, which will manufacture communications equipment, and NCR, the computer company. The trivestiture announcement boosted AT&T's stock 10% and led to the downsizing announcement, which drove the stock still higher and which Allen still defends. Putting off the inevitable, given the dramatic changes in our industry, would only lead to weakness and more draconian steps later. So I'm convinced that some downsizing was necessary to protect the jobs of the 270,000 people who will make up the three new companies. That didn't make the decision any less painful for me personally. At an AT&T job center in Boston, we assembled a group of former employees. They think that a system of pitting shareholders against them, the stakeholders, is simply short-sighted. If all of your employees could walk out tomorrow, what's the value of the corporation? What do the shareholders have? Nothing. I think what happens today is the shareholders are dictating to the company what they want. And they want more money. And they want it now, they want it fast. To its critics then, AT&T has been playing to the short-term thinking of Wall Street. And the company's recent downward revision of the original 40,000 downsizing figure has fueled their suspicions. Even Rick Miller thinks the company may have gone too far in its efforts to show shareholders it meant business. If we, uh, if we knew the way it was going to come out, we would have thought a lot harder about the way that we, uh, we uh, uh, made the announcement. You could have maybe gotten away with announcing, announcing less. Last week, I met with a group of my uh, uh, peers, CFOs from other large companies, and uh, one person in the room asked the other CFOs if any of them were going to undertake a major layoff or a major restructuring charge this year. And um, everyone in the room said, no way, that, uh, that even though they had things to do that were important to their company, that they were going to do it in ways that were small and disguised as opposed to making the grand announcement. For their take on the shareholder-stakeholder debate, we turn to the former AT&T employees. Who do they think the firm should be run for? I think if you run a company for its stakeholders, the community, the people, the employees, that out of that grows the reward to your shareholders. I'm a stakeholder. I'm here doing the best job I can 
to make sure that the shareholders are getting what they need. Not surprisingly, this is a group of former AT&Ters. A trio of new recruits had a different response. I think the shareholders, I mean, they're, they're the owners, they're, it, it's their money. Shareholders, yes, because we have to turn a profit, we have to keep them happy. I believe I, I would have to go with the shareholders. But perhaps the ambivalence isn't just a matter of having a current job at AT&T. More than 10% of the company's stock is owned by its employees, both past and present. They are stakeholders in one sense, shareholders in another. I'm an AT&T shareholder also, but uh, I got nervous a while ago and thought it peaked around uh, in, in the 60s, so I, I, I sold half of mine. It's, so you're a short-term shareholder too? You bet. I would have told you shareholder 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, but I would have said that if you have a sustained growth above a certain part of your business plan, 7 or 8%, that's fine. Now it's getting to be 12, 15, 20%. And, and uh, the five-year business plans we used to do, just nobody does anymore. We're lucky to do an annual one. But the reason you no longer have five-year plans is because shareholders like you are dumping the stock if it's not doing well. Is that right? Uh, that's, yeah, I, that's exactly right. You've, you've, you've kind of got us all. I caught them all. Well, that may not actually be so surprising because I'm one of them. My family investing strategy, crafted right here in this office, is about as passive as you can get. But through stock pension purchases at work, my wife wound up with a few hundred shares of AT&T. So we are AT&T shareholders, as surely are some of you. In fact, a great many Americans own some stock, either directly or indirectly, through a pension plan, say, and are thus shareholders. And almost all of us, in one way or another, are stakeholders. So in a sense, the shareholder-stakeholder debate is not in the stars, but in ourselves. And so long as we, these shareholders, demand rising returns, we, the stakeholders, will feel rising pressure.